the radical right and populist parties seem to be gaining tra tra traction. Right here, PVV's, uh, Geert Wilders' PVV uh, won the most seats by a landslide and is now in the driving seat for the formation. Uh, this is in combination with a victory of Robert Fico in Slovakia, a victory of Javier Milay in Argentina, more uh, Georgia Maloney in Italy. Is the far right really on the rise? If so, what factors are behind it? There's no one better to talk to than Kas Mude. Kas Mude is one of the leading scholars on populism in the far right. He's written countless articles, including the populist zeitgeist and populism, a very short introduction. Aside from that, he's also created the most cited definition for populism. Who better to speak to about current events than Kas Mude? Welcome. Thank you. So, welcome, Kas. Thank you for being here. Uh, you are Dutch, but you live in the United States. Why did you move to the US? <laughs> for my wife. Um, which, uh, yeah, that's the whole story. Uh, without her and without my family, I, I wouldn't have left and I would definitely have already returned long ago. But um, my wife is there, my family is there, so I'm there. Nice. Um, okay. So you arrive here uh, just after we've elected our own blonde haired populist. In what way does this moment remind you of 2016? Yeah, so that's, it's interesting because 2016 didn't do much with me emotionally. Um, I don't have a particularly high opinion of the US and while I was surprised that Trump won, um, it didn't, the country didn't disappoint me because the country always disappoints me in a <laughs> sense. And um, the Dutch elections were different. I mean, uh, I was, uh, had hurt. Um, on the one hand, I, I have left 25 years ago, and so this is what, what emigres have. They, they try to update, but you have a different idea of the country. Um, but I just totally didn't see it coming. I must say I was probably less affected emotionally by the result than by the way that the media and politics responded to the result. This typical Dutch complacency of, yeah, but like it doesn't matter because we in the Netherlands, we're smart people, we'll solve this. Um, that's like the intelligent lockdown of, of like <laughs> COVID. And so it was hard. It was harder than 2016, even though my personal consequence is much less, obviously, because I don't live here. So <clears throat> whatever comes out of it, and it will not be the same as a Trump government, um, doesn't affect me in the way that US politics affects me. OK, before delving into current events, we first want to walk the audience and uh, through a very short introduction of populism and of the far right. In one of your most cited works, The Populist Zeitgeist, you give a definition of populism being a thin-centered ideology uh, separating society ultimately into two homogenous and antagonistic groups, uh, the pure people versus the corrupt elite, and that politics should be an expression of the volonté générale or the general will of the people. Could you explain a bit more in depth what that means? So the essence of, of my understanding of, of populism is that it's based on monism and moralism. So the distinction between the people and the elite with the people being good, the elite being bad is pretty much part of every definition of populism. I would say that there is now a decent consensus that populism is predominantly a set of ideas, so that wasn't necessarily that different. But for me, it's only populism if you consider the people as a homogenous block, which means that you think that every, every member of the people has exactly the same values and interests. The same for the elite. Every single one of them is corrupt. And that's the second part of the definition is that the distinction between people and elite is not about whether you have power or whether you have money or, or class. It's about morals. 
the people are pure at heart, not ethnicity, but pure at heart, and the elite are corrupt. <clears throat> and so it is a moralistic type of politics, which is fundamentally different from, let's say, Marxism, which is not about morals, but about interests. So uh, speaking about morals, populism carries a lot of normative implications. Some people see it as an insult. Some people even see it as a compliment. Could you maybe briefly go by some of the potential positive and negative of populism? Well, so populism is inherently against liberal democracy because liberal democracy, which very simply stated is a combination of majority rule and minority rights is based on pluralism. And in pluralism, you see society as consisting of different groups with different interests, different values, but they're all legitimate. And out of that, you try to get some kind of compromise. <clears throat> In populism, because it's monist, there are only two groups, the pure people and the corrupt elite. But the corrupt elite are corrupt and therefore illegitimate. So you're against like, compromise. So inherently, populism is bad for liberal democracy. That being said, Populist in opposition can, can at times do good things in the sense that they can raise issues that are being kept out of the debate. And here in the Netherlands, for example, <clears throat> this is what right-wing populists did, and particularly Pim Fortuyn, with issues like immigration and European integration, which were by and large consciously kept out of the agenda for the, si for the simple reason that the electorates of all the major parties were split on these issues. And so they, they had no interest in making these central. But at the same time, there was a significant minority that was skeptic on these issues, and they had no voice. Um, so moving on a little bit to the far right, because as well as populism, you are a preeminent scholar in the far right. What is the far right? Mm -hmm. So the, I use the term far as a combination of extreme and radical. Now right is, I, I use in, in an understanding of an Italian political philosopher, Noberto Bobbio, who, who describes left and right not on the basis of socioeconomics, but kind of a meta-analysis about the views on, on egalitarianism. And for, for him, um, the right sees inequalities as natural and outside of the purview of the state, whereas the left sees them as unnatural and wants the state to create a more equal society. So that is where the right is. The far right is every part of the right that doesn't support liberal democracy. The extreme right doesn't believe in democracy per se. It doesn't believe that people should elect their own leaders can think about fascism. So in Far Right Today, uh, you discuss how the radical right and nativism have become potent force, more potent forces than populism. Why do you think this nativism has become a more important division versus the people versus the elite cleavage? Well, it hasn't become. Like, nativism has always been the core of the far right within Europe at the very least. Populism is actually a relatively recent phenomenon in Europe, particularly Western Europe, and became only relevant in the 80s and actually more than 90s. Um, the, the, this is actually one of the problems that I have with the term populism as a, unqualified. Like I don't like it when we refer to people like Wilders or Le Pen as populist rather than as populist radical right because the core of their ideology is not populism. The core is nativism. It's a xenophobic form of nationalism. The key enemy is the ethnic other. It's not <clears throat> like the ethnically similar elite. Um, and actually what you see today is that populism becomes less important, particularly among parties that are more successful. And it's very simple. Like, far-right ideas are getting more and more mainstream, and far-right parties get more mainstream. 
And that means that they no longer see the whole elite as negative because half of that elite will now govern with them. And so Meloni in Italy is not particularly populist. The Sweden Democrats were not particularly populist in the last years because the mainstream right reached out to them. Um, why do you think that, so you talk about a rise in far-right ideology, why does that rise exist? The mainstreaming, you mean? Yeah, the mainstreaming. I think there are, there are a lot of different reasons. Um, first of all, 9-11. <clears throat> It, but 9-11 was kind of the trigger. It, it gave legitimacy to ideas that had been around for a long time but couldn't be expressed. But now they could be expressed through an acceptable frame of protecting liberal democracy, protecting Western values rather than protecting the Dutch nation, for example. Um, I think what also plays a, a major role is that in the 1990s, the center parties converged on neoliberalism, and very broadly stated, which meant that socioeconomic policies were no longer really useful in campaigns because you didn't stand out. And so those two together, like a focus after 9-11 on identity issues, on security, on immigration, and the fact that socioeconomically you're pretty much the same, like pushed it in that direction. Now, there was only really one voice there that had an idea, and that was the far right. Uh, yeah, okay, so, of course, if we're going to discuss the far right, I think we have to discuss the Netherlands. I think many people were surprised by the win of Geert Wilders in the recent elections, and he won by a large margin, 37 seats. Why do you think Wilders was able to get that many seats? So let me be clear, I didn't see that coming either. Um, normally Dutch polls are pretty good. Um, the fact that he did far better than even Maurice de Hond polled is, says a lot because he always over polls them. But at the same time, if you just look back, it was the perfect storm for him. Like, the issue was about immigration. That is the last FU that Mark Rutte gave us is breaking up the government about immigration to prevent it becoming again about stickstuff and losing against Bay Bay Bay. And so, boom, you have the issue that he owns, right? And then Yesu Goes <coughs> adds to that a discussion about whether or not he, Wilders, like, is actually what the Germans call coalitionsfähig, whether he can govern with him. Right? Now, on top of that, the other two issues, mainly housing and the very difficult to translate bestaanszekerheid, <coughs> were both highly racialized. Like the debate about them was actually, the housing debate was all about how asylum seekers were taking houses away, like status houses. Less than one in 10 houses are actually going to them. Of course, the housing crisis is created, particularly by the VVD by not building, but it's much easier to just blame the refugees. And so while we had three different issues, we actually only had one, and it was the issue of Wilders. And then the media jumped on it by arguing that Wilders had become milder. Right? And I think lastly, and not unimportantly, you now have a choice be because there's also the, the kind of vacuum after Rutte. Rutte has been incredibly successful in capturing the, the kind of established nativist vote. And now Rutte was gone, and for those people there were two choices. Wilders, who before was seen as too radical, but had just been mainstreamed, and Yeshil Goethe, who is a former refugee, who is a woman, and is a woman of color. So you have a woman of color who is a former refugee or a white dude who has said for 25 years that he will live or die on this issue. And I think that was a major reason why, like, what was it? Something like 15% of AVD went <coughs> to pay VV. Yeah, um, so the size of this vic victory also demonstrates a really clear popular appeal of the pay and their 
values. Um, so how much of that can really be attributed to bad campaign decisions or what other factors are at play for the Dutch electorate? Well, complacency I've already mentioned, which I think rather than tolerance is really the national characteristic of Dutch people. But um, I, we, we already are almost a couple of decades without a left. So that is very, very important too. And to his credit, I think Timmermans brought more left-wing visibility than, than I can remember virtually in this century. Um, but you also have to accept that Geert Wilders is a very skillful politician. Uh, yes, the rest set him up for it, but you have more than enough people, think Thierry Baudet, who would mess that up. Like, he didn't. He made the most of it. And that is the most depressing thing because Wilders has been around for forever. Like, the fact that the media and politics still underestimated him, like, I think that should lead to far more soul searching than I've seen in the last weeks. So speaking of Thierry Baudet, in the Dutch electorate, we see switches from the, the FAD, then later to the BBB, and now again to the PFV, between a bunch of different radical right parties. To what extent do you think this also may be a protest vote against the established government? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, this was one of the most dramatic governments that, that we've ever had. Like, I mean, it was that <coughs> by birth. Like, um, and so that plays a major, major role. Like, it was a government that no one wanted, that Kaag should have killed, and that never got momentum. And, and so you have to see that. But I think what is important <clears throat> is that when you look at the aggregate level, it looks like Dutch elections are very volatile, as if Dutch people are all over the place. But actually, there is a sizable minority that just looks for some type of right-wing, right-wing populist alternative. And sometimes it's LPF, sometimes it's Forum, sometimes it's BBB. Again, partly it is who the media gives most attention to, right? <clears throat> and NSA was interesting in that respect because Onzicht is clearly not a populist. At the same time, he is a very right-wing politician. And during the campaign, it became clearer and clearer that his real heart was on social cultural issues, right? And so that made him attractive for that part, whereas it's a little bit the same. The NSA to me was a bit the same as the LPF. The LPF at the beginning got from left and right. But as soon as the LPF became a bit more defined, it became pretty much a right-wing populist party. The NSA now is much more a right-wing electorate like, than, than a broader electorate. Yeah. So winning the most votes in the Netherlands is not enough to be in charge. You mm -hmm. also need to form a coalition, which given some of his, some of voters' radical stances in the past have complicated things somewhat. Um, if you had a gla crystal ball, how would you estimate his chances to, voters' chances to form a government? I think all chances are bad. Like, I mean, so there is no government that realistically can be formed that will have a majority in the upper house, in the Senate, which is completely ignored, but is a major, major problem. I mean, they're far away, either the right-wing vari variety, like of v PVV, VVD, NSA, and BBB, they're still far from a Senate majority. Um, the other alternative, which would be what PVDA, GroenLinks, and then NSA, VVD, D66, or BBB, whatever it is, highly unlikely because that would mean that Franz Timmermans would have to accept not to be the prime minister or be the prime minister of a right-wing government. Neither of those are likely, which leaves the kind of Greek-Spanish option of having new elections without trying a, a government which I think is difficult for a, a country that is so obsessed with governmentability. 
Um, and there is no reason to assume that the next election will do much, like will we'll create a clearer majority. And say that we would get a GroenLinks, a VVD, NSA, and maybe D66 cabinet or BBB, wouldn't that be similar to the previous cabinets we've had and have led to so much discontent of mix between left and right? Yeah, I think it would be disastrous um, because they can't get anything done and the only reason why they would be together is to keep builders out. Um, and and I, I think at the moment it's not necessary. But the reason why I think that the builders led government is still the most likely is that they have set him up very well to to get the kind of compromise from him. Like as as soon as he says, okay, I won't ban Korans, I won't ban mosques, I won't do Nexit, then everyone will say, oh he's totally he's totally now moderate. Like he thinks the same as us, which is true. But that's not because he is moderate, that's because the rest has radicalized. Um, and so I think what particularly the VVD and NSA are waiting for is that we all forget the Geert Wilders and become the Geert Milders over the holidays. And then they will start the discourse, like we have to take our responsibility, like it's an important period, we can't have chaos, etc., etc., etc. So this is obviously a big change for the Dutch political scene. What do you think will be the biggest consequences for the Netherlands? Well, I think that we should recognize the people who are targeted the most. Um, I'm a little bit annoyed by all the stories, particularly in international media, of what will it do for Europe. It won't do much for Europe. But I wouldn't want to be a Muslim and live under a government that has as a prime minister someone who clearly doesn't see you as a full citizen. I wouldn't want to be a transgender person and have this government. I mean, to be honest, <clears throat> even gays and lesbians, like for all the talk that he has about it, voting behavior hasn't been particularly stellar either. Be an academic, particularly of a left per persuasion, is not particularly good. Um, so there are a lot of targeted groups, I mean, some with more power than others. I think rather than looking at whether Putin will be the big winner or whether the EU will get into crisis, um, particularly Dutch people should first look at their Muslim neighbors. Uh, yeah, so there's currently a lot of economic insecurity in the Netherlands. And in 2015, where we also saw a large rise of right, radical right populism, there was the so-called immigration crisis. Uh, what, is, do you, what effects do you think that threats or perceived threats have on the chances for radical right populism? So, I mean, there, all research shows that the main driver of far-right vo voting is what is called cultural backlash. Uh, it's, it's primarily about views about immigration and integration. That being said, economic anxiety, however vaguely defined, can play a role. But it has to be translated socioculturally for the far right to win. In the US, we call it, it has to be racialized. Like, so if you talk about economic inequality in a non-racial way, like, you don't get to the, to the PVV. You get to the SP. Right? You don't get to Trump, you get to Sanders. But we don't. Right? We talk about in economic inequality, and we say that this is because of globalization, this is because of immigration. And so that, those two play, play a role. And so I, having not lived here for a very long time, I saw that the Netherlands now is the most unequal country in Europe, even more unequal than the UK, where I did live several years, well, several decades ago now, and that is absolutely and utterly shocking, right? And arguing that that has no consequence is, is very naive. But we also have to keep in mind that if we wouldn't have racialized that debate, that the far right wouldn't have profited in the same way. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how these parties construct 
this racialized narrative? So um, let's say one of the key things of, of Wilders and Le Pen is welfare chauvinism, like where they support the welfare state, but only for their own people. And the argument is very simple. Like, welfare state is good. It's something that we civilized countries do. Um, it's solidarity, but we should be solidary with our own. And we can afford our welfare state if like, we wouldn't give it to those who don't belong. Economically, very dubious argument, but doesn't matter. Works very well, right? I've given the example of the housing. Right? You can reduce an incredibly complex issue of housing, which goes into issues of environmental legislation, for example, as well as all kinds of other things, to just like, well, if we don't have refugees anymore, then everyone can live in their house, right? Great, and so they, they do it like that. This is the same with like gay rights, like, here in the Netherlands and in some North European countries, we have what is called homo-nationalism, where gay rights are being defended in the name of nationalism. But that also reduces all homophobia to Muslims, as if we don't have a proud and continued tradition of homophobia of the Christian right here. Right? And so that is how you do it. Like you amplify things that, of course, exist. Obviously, there is homophobia among parts of the Muslim community. Otherwise, you can't sell it, right? But you make that into one homogenous category, and then you whitewash whatever you have in your own. So I think you very clearly elaborate on the dangers narratively of this uh, far-right power, uh, but you also comment that you don't think this will have a large impact on the EU. Why do you think that is, especially in combination with other far-right leaders such as Maloney or Viktor Orban? Well, first and foremost, because the EU doesn't go anywhere. Like, the EU has been muddling through pretty much since 1992. And that isn't because of the far-right. That is because all kind of other internal differences. It's the same with... We, we all focus on Orban as being like the one who is against sanctions, but we have countries around the EU that have all kind of exceptions to sanctions, from Italy to France to Slovakia, right? <clears throat> um, but loudmouths like Orban and, and the far right are easy ways to kind of take shelter. Like Orban was against the redistribution of refugees, but so was Rutte. But Rutte didn't have to say it because Orban said it, because for Orban it went, worked well. Like for, for Rutte it would be more problematic. So first of all, he is actually not going anywhere. Second, the far right is divided. And like that is to a certain extent what keeps them so weak. Like roughly right-wing Eurosceptics broadly defined of about one third of the seats in the European Parliament. And yet, they're almost completely irrelevant in the parliament. And the reason is that there are two far-right groups, identity and democracy and European conservatives and reformists. Then there are several far-right parties that are non-inscript, they're not in a group. And then there are still some who are in the mainstream groups, like Ano in Renew um, and Jansha from Slovenia in EPP. Um, this is the big gift that Putin gave us. Because, because of Putin, Orban is now persona non grata pretty much around Europe. <clears throat> Orban is the only one who has the means and the skills to create one large far-right group. But because Putin is toxic at this moment, Orban is toxic. Like PIS, I think, cannot be seen to ally itself closely with Orban at this moment. And so <clears throat> I think as a consequence, like, and there are all kind of other elements to it, that there won't be a massive change. Is the Netherlands going to be even more egocentric than before? Yes, undoubtedly, right? But is that a massive shift from how the Netherlands was under Rutte? No. Um. 
but there have been many talks of the influence the Netherlands, the, the Netherlands has had in recent years with Rutte punching above its weight. Do you think that will go, go away if we have a Nexit supporting Vildos? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But that would have gone away with anyone. Like, I mean, Rutte <coughs> was the longest democratically elected leader, Orban being the longest leader. <coughs> and um, Rutte worked the international circuit really good. That's why he's the front runner for the next NATO job. Like, I mean, it's largely an old boys network, and that's his natural environment. Um, the Netherlands generally punches above its weight, like it's, it's kind of one of the smaller big countries. Um, <clears throat> but if it is Wilders, because Wilders is seen internationally much more as a caricature, I think, than he really is. He is, he is mostly reduced to the Wilders on Twitter rather than the Wilders in Parliament, where he has been a pretty effective parliamentarian, actually, for a very long time, of course. Um, so moving on to something you already hinted on, uh, combining the mainstream right-wing parties and the far right, uh, in the last Dutch election, they got two-thirds of all available seats. Mm. Um, you have described yourself repeatedly as a political leftist. Why do you think left-wing parties in the Netherlands performed so poorly elector electorally? It's not only the Netherlands. Um, they're not even represented in the Czech parliament. Um, it's, it's, fair, it's difficult. I mean, yes, at this, at, on the one hand, as long as social cultural issues dominate campaigns, the left is at a disadvantage, generally. The Greens do well, but the Greens have a much smaller electorate because it's mostly highly educated, younger urban people. Social Democrats are clearly struggling. Personally, uh, I think, and that's also backed up by some research, its potential electorate wants clear positions. It wants clear positions on both socioeconomic and social cultural topics. The Social Democrats are in the middle of everything all the time. And so they think that they sell a kind of like the adult in the room, but no one is lo looking for that, right? <clears throat> The other thing is that particularly for younger people, they have a very different image of social democracy than I have. Like, I, I grew up <clears throat> in like the end of the heydays of social democracy, but I still associate social democracy with welfare state, with protection of workers, with connections with unions. <clears throat> for most of the people that I see here, you associate or maybe you're now that young that you now associate them again with opposition, but if you were actually in your 30s, you associate it with the party that accepted austerity, that pushed right-wing policies through, right? And so social democracy, social democratic parties are going to struggle with a whole generation that associates them with a party that in power will just follow the, the, the right. Now, why doesn't the radical left like profit? That's tricky. I mean, the Netherlands is very easy. Like, what was it? Her seventh electoral defeat in a row. Like, many radical left parties are cult parties. Like, they have leaders who have ridiculous amounts of power. There is very little feedback loop. The SP is a painful example, but to a certain extent, Mélenchon as well, and and others. These most of what we call radical left parties are former communist parties, Maoist or Marxist Leninist, whatever they are, who still have an internal stru uh, structure that, that is very frustrating, particularly for younger people to get involved. Um, but I have to believe that this is going to change. Personally, I don't think it will change with the current parties. Um, so I think one of the paradoxes in some of the left-wing parties is this uh, real care for the working class <clears throat> combined with a disdain, maybe rightly, for far-right parties and their voters, many of whom are working class. Where does this disconnect between the working class and its traditional representatives come from? I'm not sure whether there is necessarily disdain um, and Definitely that disdain isn't new. Um, 
like Marxism is full of disdain for the working class. After all, like the Communist Party was the avant-garde. <clears throat> um, it was the one that was going to uplift the people who were kept stupid by capitalism and religion. So this kind of paternalism of, of the enlightened left-wing leaders who are lifting up the people, that, that's the whole story. Um, I think um, what is a major problem, and uh, you see that here in the Netherlands, but somewhere in other countries too, there's a disconnect between the people in the party and particularly in the leadership and the groups that they pretend to represent. Like, I mean, I speak to, to social democratic parties <clears throat> throughout Europe. I speak to people like me university-educated white dudes, mostly, sometimes white women, but still university-educated and almost always urban, right? Um, <clears throat> so that is a problem. And in that respect, and I think we should note that, actually, the parliamentarians that PVV brings into the Dutch parliament has been terrible for gender, but has been phenomenal for class. Right? PVV which incidentally has the only leader who hasn't gone to university. Also, as I said before, one of the best politicians. You don't have to go to university to be smart, to be smart right? But we have created this kind of political class right? where the idea is that you need to have a certain trajectory to be able to do politics. Um, and, and that has created a bubble. So, as you said, um, populists and far right politicians are good at constructing a narrative of the people versus the elite. However, a lot of times, uh, populist politicians themselves come from elite background, like Donald Trump, or represent elite interests. For example, the Baby Bay representing farmers who have the highest percentage of millionaires of any profession. How are they so successful at shaping our perception of who the elite is? Yeah, so I mean, if you pull. Paul Taggart wrote in, in his book in 2000, Populism, which is full of phenomenal one-liners, that populism is politics for ordinary people by extraordinary leaders. And um, it's true. Almost all of the leaders of pop populist parties or, or populist leaders are what, what Christopher Rovira Kaltas and I have called <coughs> um, outsider insiders. Like, so Trump, for example, yes, was rich, but he wasn't part of the inner circle of New York. Berlusconi, same thing, new money. Like, and actually, a lot of populists are new money. That was also like the LPF crowd was also all new money. <clears throat> and, and so they have, a, they have a lot of chip on their shoulder. And at the same time, they, they do have the skills, context, resources to make it. Um, why are they successful? Because at a basic level, there is something in it. Like, <clears throat> take the Netherlands, almost everyone has governed with everyone. Right? It, is, it is a group of people that all roughly look the same, have the same background. Um, they often, until recently, held roughly similar views pro-multiculturalism, pro-European integration, pro-neoliberalism. Um, so it, it wasn't that big of a stretch. The stretch is that you make it completely hom homogenous and that you make them corrupt. Because right? most of these people didn't get anything personally out of it. They actually truly believed in those things or thought that that was the best way to a political career. Right? So if you have highly polarized politics, it becomes more difficult. That being said, I live in the, in the US, highly polarized, and yet there are still people who believe, like uh, when Trump speaks about the elite. Um, but you have to think about the media structure as well. So one of the groups that's been very vulnerable to be painted as the elite is the left, who do claim to support the working class, but are called elitist by populist parties. Why is the left so vulnerable for this uh, attack? I think the left has the massive 
crisis of identity and a lack of um, self-confidence. Like, I mean, how, how can you, after 40 years of neoliberalism, in most countries of having been out of power or completely secondary in governments, like, be put away as the elite? Like, just look at the past governments like in this country, how can you blame the left for what has happened, right? But we do, right? I mean, because whenever there is a critique, then you get these voices, yes, well, they have a point, blah, 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 blah. And I don't know where that went, but for some reason, like if you are, if you are highly educated and you're rich and you care about poor people, right? somehow you're a worse person than when you actually only care about yourself. Because then you're a social justice warrior. Like, how did we get to the point that caring about someone else because you can is worse than just being an egocentric prick when you have the money to, to actually help people? But that's where we are. And, of course, liberal media left-wing media, if you want to call that that way, like the New York Times or the Volkskant or whatever, they're full of that. And I, don't, I don't know why. I mean, I think we have to get into psychology there. Um, <clears throat> but I think the left should really wake up. And I think the left st still makes the mistake that they think that they have ideological hegemony. And they don't. Right? They lost it probably a decade or two ago. Uh, could you maybe shortly explain what you mean by that ideological hegemony? So ideological hegemony, it's, it comes from Gramsci, a, Marx, a Marxist thinker. And by and large, you have hegemony when your ideas are so broadly shared that they're no longer seen as ideological. <clears throat> and so for a long time, the welfare state was that in a country like the Netherlands, right? <coughs> Solidarity, progress whatever, right? Those are, those are now contested values, right? The welfare state, there's a large part that actually thinks that's not good, we should take care of ourselves, and others think it's only good for the own people, right? <coughs> things like progress, solidarity, justice, whatever, all of these things are now contested. Like, if there was any hegemony in the, in the 90s and the first decade, at least till the Great Recession, it was that the market is a better mechanism than the state, which is a right-wing like, ideological view, view, right? And so <clears throat> the social democracy, it has been claimed that social democracy is kind of the victim of its own success, and to a certain extent it is. A lot of its points were adopted in milder forms by the center-right before then they went to the center right. Yeah, so on that, you've talked a lot about the normalization of the far right and its dangers. So one of the examples you've named is Vox, and it's getting its legit in Spain, and it's getting its legitimacy largely from the mainstream PP party. Uh, however, unlike the Netherlands, um, in the last election, Vox underperformed both expectations and polls. And it's now one of the examples people point to when arguing against a cordon sanitaire or an exclusive ex or an exclusion of the far right. Is there an argument to be made to include them? Well, so, I mean, there was, so in Spain there was actually a cordon sanitaire in certain uh, regions and not in others. Um, I've never been a particular fan of the cordon sanitaire. Um, <coughs> mostly because it was always applied broader. So the initiator of the Cordon Sanitaire was a Flemish politician called Jos Gijsels, who had a very limited understanding of what a Cordon Sanitaire should be. It just meant that you do not govern with the far right. But it doesn't mean that you don't speak about issues like immigration or, or security. During most of the 80s, 90s, the Cordon was that. It was much broader. I think today we are far beyond a situation where you can have a cordon sanitaire. The far right is simply too big. If you're going to exclude the far right consistently in countries like Sweden 
or the Netherlands, you're going to have the same pretty much incoherent government all the time. So rather than focusing on the cordon sanitaire, right-wing parties in particular should focus on under which conditions will we govern with the far right? Like, what are our red lines? What do we expect? What, what do we say is essential? And as I argued in my last Guardian piece, this was for a while reasonably straightforward because they were the senior partner. Now they're the junior partner. And so how do you enforce your red lines against your big brother, right? There's no debate about that. And as a consequence, now they have to improvise. Every single time that a far-right leader will do something crazy, you will have a debate. So <laughs> what do you think the strategies then should be for both concerned left-wing parties and concerned right-wing parties who are, are in that little brother position to the radical rights? So there are two things here. One is how to deal with the far right. To a certain extent, that's a secondary question and, and less important. The other one is how do we strengthen liberal democracy, which is far more important. Now, how to deal with the far right? <clears throat> I think first and foremost, within the structure of liberal democracy. Anything that goes against that, you do not do. That means that you can accept limiting immigration. Right? That's not by definition anti-liberal democracy. It depends on whether it goes against human rights uh, and those kind of things. And some right-wing parties believe this. And so it's not my position, but you can do that. You cannot go against basic human rights. You cannot go against the rule of law. You cannot go against the separation of powers. <clears throat> so you have to stay within that framework. However, in the medium to long term, you have to make people believe in your program. And the problem is most parties don't have a program. They have a couple of points, but they don't have an ideology. And we live in a century of crises. Right? We have such crises so close to each other that empirically you can actually no longer study the effect. Right? What is the effect of COVID? Probably massive, but how do we know? Because two years later, you have the Russia-Ukraine war. Right? In a crisis, like, and this is an example I often give. If I, if I offer you $100 or euro for that matter, like, you will perhaps ask me why. And I will say because I want to, and you will take it. If I ask you for $100, you will certainly ask me why. And if I say, because I want to, you will not give it. You want to have a story what you get out of that. That story is ideology. And ideology is what you need in crises. When it went well, you could have pragmatism. But now we need bigger stories. The far right has a story. So let's go to audience questions. Um, there's a lot of you. I'm sure there's interest. Uh, let's go to the green sweater. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, yeah. So I wanted to ask, so Hoga and Marx talk about the emergence of a transnational cleavage. Uh, and I was wondering, um, it is kind of blurry, whether this cleavage is a result of far-right nationalism and nativism, or if it's more something as a result of populism. Well, result is kind of a weird word to use, but what is the cause of that cleavage? And also maybe is it bottom up or top down cleavage that has emerged? Okay, maybe for the ones who haven't read this piece in their political science course. I mean, generally there are two different cleavages, the socioeconomic one, state versus market, and a libertarian authoritarian one in a sense like, should we discipline or should we leave people um, or a vertical and horizontal society. Hoge and Marx argue that there's a third other people do as well, which they call global, national, in a sense, open, closed, pro-EU, anti-EU, whatever it is, right? Um, I'm 
not so sure whether that cleavage is about that. I think that cleavage is, is the immigration cleavage. Um, <clears throat> and, and so I think the EU as an issue is still an absolutely minor issue. And most of your skepticism is actually fed by other reasons. Um, immigration, <laughs> to a large extent. Um, and so I think the, all cleavages are constructed by elites. But cleavages can only become successful if they translate a certain feeling that exists, right? And so there is, there is reluctance towards um, immigration, towards change, ethnic change. There is reluctance towards Brussels, something that is opaque, far away, etc. Is it particularly relevant for many people? No. It has to be made relevant by politics, but that is what politics does in a sense, right? Um, and so I do believe that it is there. I'm, I'm still not sure what drives what, right? So again, I remain skeptical about whether the EU is actually something that many people care enough about to vote. I think rather that many people care about immigration and they see the EU as creating immigration or they care about nationalism in a sense, about their country being homogenous and, 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 and stable and they think that the EU undermines it. Um, so quickly for time, let's do one more. Uh, at the back, you were earlier. I, yes, you mentioned multiple times that the left has an identity crisis and an ideological crisis. And we see that the left is like based on communism, social democrats, whatever. How do you see this new ideology forming and how would the left like get a larger electoral now if we have this identity crisis? Yeah, so maybe I should qualify that because I'm old school. So when I talk about the left, I actually do talk about versions of Marxism, in a sense, be that democratic socialism or social democracy. There is, of course, a left element in the environmental movement. Um, I don't necessarily think the whole Green Party is left, but uh, I mean, it goes broader. But I'm, I'm not going to speak to that. Um, I personally, and I've argued this for quite a while now, I think that the ideological rejuvenation has to come from outside of the existing parties. You cannot trust the parties with that because the parties are concerned with their own parties. They reduce social democracy to themselves. Right? And so they think that social democracy does well when the social democratic party does well. We have seen that social democratic parties can do really well electorally and social democracy does not. Think about Tony Blair, or think about Wim Kok, for that matter. <clears throat> um, so I believe that we have to develop both the idea and the movement outside of the parties, partly trade unions. I, they were the foundation of left-wing politics in the early 20th century. They're in a horrible state, and many young people have no connection to trade unions. It's highly problematic. Um, but also through local initiatives. To a certain extent, center-left parties will have to fight for the support of new left-wing movements. That, I think that's the only way for, so, for social democratic parties to truly change. I'm not saying that they're as right-wing today as they were 20 years ago. No, I mean, they have shifted a little bit more to the left. Um, but as I said before, they're not trusted by a lot of people. Um, but I, I think we, it has to be done outside of that. And of course, that is a problem because so, particularly social democratic parties in many countries still have a phenomenal infrastructure which organizes all these type of things. 
but thereby it also kind of sanitizes them. Um, so slowly starting to wrap up, in, aside from a prominent academic, you are also a major voice in much of the public debate. So how do you combine your role as an opinionated public intellectual with an objective scientist? Oh, but scientists are not objective. I mean, A, there is nothing that is objective. That's <clears throat> um, always contextual. Um, I don't pretend to be neutral um, because A, neutral is still political. Neutral means supporting the status quo. <clears throat> um, I think actually there is an advantage of being open about what you stand for. That way my readers can see whether my work has been influenced by that. I don't necessarily think so. I've always said that the far right has a lot of talent and par creates part of its own success. Like the idea that as a lefty you cannot see like positive things in the thing on the right <clears throat> is a simplistic view. Of course it has a consequence. I mean, there are a lot of right wing people who don't consider my work academic. Did they ever look at my at academic work? No. Like, um, so I, it's a struggle I, I don't struggle with. Like I think what is much more problematic is how far do you go in your role as public intellectual? Right? And so I actually stepped back this year. I just wrote my first columns because of <coughs> you people voting, the Dutch elections. Um, but I have pretty much done almost no media for a year, partly mental health. Like, I just can't take it. Like, I don't study one country. I study a lot of different countries. There's a lot of misery, and it's in my country of my heart and the country where I live. And so following the news every single day was just exhausting. And my children deserve more of their father than someone who is anxious because of Twitter, right? And so I, I got out of that. I also think it helped me step back. Um, there's a lot of alarmism there's, a, there's almost like a bidding war of who has the darkest scenario of what is going on. The media always wants more. Like, first it was the far right, then it was fascism, then it became civil war. Like, I mean, <clears throat> and and you, you get into that. And so I think there's massive value for academics to be in the public debate. If you cannot explain what you're doing to someone who is not an academic, then you don't fully understand what you're doing. At the same time, it can make you sloppy. It works too much on your ego. Um, and it can be depressing, right? And so I think, I think you, we should try to combine it. Let me also stress, because it's important I have a I have some friends here on the faculty and in others. I'm a white guy, pretty old, reasonably big, um, who lives far away. <clears throat> I don't get much hassle. I, I'm sure I get frats and like, fan mail. Um, but it, it's, like, it doesn't come home. I have particularly female colleagues in this country where it does come home, where stickers are at their door. Right? And so I think it is important that we, we give academics a choice. Particularly women and academics of color pay a pretty high price for being in the public eye. And they get nothing back. Like you don't get promotions because of that. Uh, universities until recently did, didn't do anything for them. I think it's important to like to to give that space, and so I'm I'm no hero. Like for me, it's way easier to criticize than for, let's say, a young woman with a migrant b background or <clears throat> uh, an openly gay or lesbian uh, academic. Um, and so I, I think that's important to say as well because I've had a couple of shitstorms on Twitter, which I've also left. Um, 
And they were not pleasant. Like, I mean, when you get hundreds of abusive far-right responses over days, that eats at you, even if you have a relatively thick skin, like I do. Um, you were here four years ago, and <coughs> if you would come back in another four years, and the far right is in retreat, what, can you tell us what we have done right to get that retreat? I think mostly we have, we have finally moved back to all issues. I, I mean, if we would talk about immigration, about Europe, but also about healthcare, also about education, also about housing, but not through the lens of immigrants, but actually just about those issues, about climate change, right? The far right will go down because they have very little to say on those topics. So broadening the agenda would be one thing. Like, hopefully, we will also have created our own narratives. Like, and I mean, look, politics is not linear. Like, I don't expect in four years that PVV will be at 45 seats. There is no reason to assume that. It's possible, but there's no reason to assume that it just goes up. At the same time, in four years, they might be down simply because they were in the government, and all government parties get put. The, the important thing is the far right is here. They're here to stay for quite some while. Like, they're as much part of the political landscape in Europe as social democracy, and actually more than Christian democracy or liberalism. Kasmada, thank you very, very much. Um, for all of you guys, uh, Christmas came early. Tomorrow, we have Tom De Bruyne here as well from one to two. Friday, we have uh, Mike Kuno, the CEO of Flow Traders, and then Monday we have Derek Sauer, the head of Moscow Times, all from 1 to 2, all here. I'm very excited. Uh, once again, thank you very much, Cosmeda.